All right, welcome everyone uh, to the third edition of DutchLink Goes Online. Uh, today we welcome Charco Edses. Charco is the director of Asia Pacific of Bau Invest Real Estate Investors. First of all, welcome Charco. Thank you, Doris. Very good. Uh, thank you for being available for this interview. Really excited to uh, go through a few questions today and to provide a little bit of structure to our conversation We'll be covering four main topics. First of all, um, for those who don't know Bau Invest, we'd love to hear a little bit more about what Bau Invest does, uh, and especially learned that you've had personally in introducing Bau Invest here about a year ago in Australia uh, and setting up office. Um, secondly, we'd love to hear about the impact that COVID-19 has on your operation here and uh, how you're dealing and responding to that. The third question came from one of our DutchLink members who is very interested in affordability and the sustainability in real estate. And uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on that and the influence that Bau Invest has on those two important topics. And then finally, we'd love to wrap up with some personal reflections uh, from you, Charco, because uh, what many people probably don't know is that you are a fantastic musician. And recently you've uh, brought together a band here in Australia, and um, there was actually going to be a, a King's Day concert that unfortunately we've had to miss. But uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about how, at a personal level, you cope with the, the current circumstances and as well uh, the band. Uh, so we'd love to hear when we're actually going to be able to come to that concert. How does that sound to you? Sounds great. Yes, sounds good. Uh, th thanks, uh, first of all, for, uh, for, for having me, I think Bauinvest, uh, and, for, and to DutchLink for organizing these interviews. Uh, it's a very nice initiative. I really enjoyed the first two uh, interviews with our Consul General, Mark van Berningen, and with Ronald van Wezel from the Hilton Hotel. And um, I am uh, pretty sure that Bauinvest is not as familiar as Hilton Hotels. So I think it's good to uh, give you know somewhat of a, a short introduction on what we do as a group. Yes, and yes. and go through all the other questions that you uh, that you just mentioned. But please help me out because I uh, I may not remember uh, each and every one. But I'll start with uh, what we do. Uh, we we're a real estate investor uh, from the Netherlands. We um, are headquartered in Amsterdam. Um, and we have uh, just opened an office in uh, the Asia Pacific region for which we have chosen Sydney. And we're about to open an uh, office in New York as well later this year. Um, in uh, the Netherlands, we have quite a big portfolio of uh, residential uh, housing assets um, and also uh, offices, retail uh, assets for senior housing or healthcare and some hotels. So that's, that's our domestic portfolio. And international, uh, globally, we, we invest as well in uh, the most developed economies, developed markets. And we only do that with local partners. So we, we, uh, we look for local expertise, groups that know their markets, and, uh, and we look for strategies that we think are interesting. Uh, and then we partner with them and we develop property or we invest in existing property, which can be yeah, every property sector as well. It's office, retail logistics, um, uh, uh, residential, uh, uh, and we mainly focus on logistics and residential for logistics because we think that, you know, online retail is really growing and that uh, really uh, uh, drives demand for uh, logistics uh, assets. Um, so that's what we've done globally. And also we've invested in residential uh, housing because Again, that's a market we, we know inside out uh, from the Netherlands. We very much like the profile. You know, people need a place to live. It's, it's a stable, uh, cash flowing product. And there's really a demand for a rental product increasingly, I should say, because it's, it's getting increasingly uh, unaffordable for mm. many people to live in cities and they do want to live in cities. So we, we try to, to make it affordable for them, uh, but via renting. Uh, so that's what we focus on, yeah. Okay, and um, if I'm correct, I think you established business about just over a year ago here in Sydney. Um, really interested in your lessons learned and your experiences of coming to Australia, um, the culture, 
the ways of doing businesses and, and things that you know you've actually found uh, interesting that you'd like to share yeah yeah well first of all we had a, a great landing you know uh, it went all very smooth and of course it's a beautiful place to live a beautiful part of the world um, and we feel privileged to live here um, I think this, the Australian people are super nice. Uh, business culture is dedicated. It's a bit uh, direct uh, as we are, uh, you know, used to in the Netherlands, but less direct than we are. Um, yeah. But it's um, it's also uh, somewhat more relaxed in some some ways, um, uh, but also quite a hands-on uh, mentality, I would say. Um, Sydney is super nice in terms of being quite an international environment. Um, and I have to say things that I found different from what I expected. I think uh, Australian culture or Australia just in general is a bit more domestic or inward looking uh, or closed in, in some aspects. And I expected from such a uh, country that this has always thrived uh, through uh, immigration. Hmm. last uh, decades especially um, but uh, yeah you do sense that uh, it's it's somewhere somewhat uh, inward looking in some uh, aspects um, and what I found interesting in the interview with uh, Frank von Berning is that he referred to uh, the UK uh, relationship and that Australian people still look uh, to UK for you know guidance or, or and any topic which is true i think uh, maybe also the us but um, uh, living here i think what also stands out is how australia has a very important uh, role within the asia pacific region mm -hmm. uh, and the strong ties it has within the region and especially with china uh, good and bad uh, and uh, you know people uh, view it as a threat but it also has a huge uh, potential yeah. So I think that relationship really dominates the headlines, which is not, I didn't get that uh, in such a big way, uh, being still based in the Netherlands, uh, but it's, um, it, it, it uh, has a lot of impact. And, and we believe Australia has a lot of potential still uh, to benefit from the growth in uh, wealth in this region, uh, mm -hmm. the growth of the aspirational middle class. And, and that's why we have invested in uh, property in Australia as well, like uh, student housing, but also other, other sectors. It's an interesting sector uh, in Australia specifically because um, what we see is that obviously Australians are very, very prone to investing in real estate, um, where in other parts of the world people might be more diversified in equity and in bonds and liquidities. And when people have got some savings here, they invested in an investment property. Uh, yeah. I was wondering how people react to you uh, working in that business, working in that industry, um, and what your experience has been in that sense over the last 12 months. Yeah, that's uh, a good observation. Um, I mean, the Financial Review has like a dedicated uh, section on property, and uh, there's always a lot about property in the news as well. So it really, it's something that uh, people focus on. And of course, the housing market in the Netherlands is, you know, uh, taking it uh, is, is, uh, in the news as well. But I think many people are invested here in the housing market. Uh, the housing market has done very well. So there was a lot of wealth created for people that, that were invested. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the, uh, of course, the, the fiscal subsidies are different here relative to the Netherlands. Uh, and it's, uh, it has driven uh, people to buy more investment property. I think that is less so the case in the Netherlands where people are subsidized to, you know, to buy their own house. Uh, but here there's more of an investment uh, market for that reason. And, and because of that, it is, um, the rental market is very different from uh, the Netherlands where we have more of an institutional rental market. There's a big uh, portion of people in the Netherlands that rent and that are happy with it. They uh, appreciate the flexibility it provides. Um, and it's actually more expensive in many, many circumstances than uh, relative to buying your house in the Netherlands, where in Australia, that's, it's the reverse. And still people really want to buy their home and, and renting is just renting, right? Uh, how how people dream. sometimes refer to it. Now that's an interesting dynamic, I think.
Um, so yeah, that's uh, property market really is a, is a topic here. Yeah, it's a big it's a big topic here. So great to be close to the fire for you. So talking about the, yes. the most recent developments, um, obviously COVID nineteen. Um, I thought about you the other day because you mentioned student housing and a lot of the international students staying in their home countries over the last months not returning to university and that being a big issue for the universities but then if you think about the the consequences of that i thought it might actually have had an impact on you as well so the question is what, what has it been the impact of covid19 on bow invest and maybe specifically on that student accommodation yeah yeah good question well first of all property is quite a slow business in a way that we buy property we rent it out and we get that rent and, and that's our return and, and a property increases in value or decreases in value so typically when there's a hiccup in the economy we don't we do experience that but in a more delayed manner compared to uh, you know someone who has to operate their their shop unit every day um, that's that's really different but the current circumstances with uh, having a lockdown of everything uh, malls being closed, uh, offices being occupied for 10%, um, international students not being able to travel to, to Australia, that really has an impact on uh, the property uh, and on, on our returns as well. And, and so we've been particularly busy with trying to get a grip uh, or a view on, on what's happening um, uh, uh, on the ground. Uh, so uh, for instance, uh, requests for, for rent relief, from uh, tenants, uh, especially in the retail, uh, our retail portfolio has been uh, quite a lot. I think 50% of tenants have asked for them. So that will bring a lot of administrative and, and uh, you know, uh, work uh, and also to negotiate uh, and find a solution in the next couple of years, I would say. Uh, mm. So it has a severe impact. Uh, for student housing specifically, um, yeah, it's difficult for students to come over. I think so far our occupancy has been okay, uh, 65, 70 percent. But if the travel bans stay in place, you know, until uh, July, August, it will be more difficult for students to come over. Foreign students, there's also domestic students that, that use these uh, student rooms. But for for international students, it will still still then be uh, difficult to to get here. Uh, I think the government uh, did announce that. Uh, there may be an exception for, uh, you know, for the education sector uh, in terms of uh, being allowed to travel to Australia. So hopefully with a good quarantine uh, strategy and uh, the product that we have developed is, is really uh, good for uh, staying in, in quarantine as well. It's self-contained units. Uh, they have independent air conditioning. Um, and our, our partner has also been very successful in facilitating uh, uh, students that, that came in when it was still possible to stay in quarantine for, for 14 days and then being, you know, being allowed to stay here. Um, but we've also looked for other uses, uh, for instance, co comparable to what uh, Ronald said, uh, with the, has done with the Hilton Hotel. We have looked uh, for, um, uh, we have uh, rented one of our uh, buildings to the government in Brisbane. Um, which is used for temporary housing for people that need a temporary housing solution driven by COVID-19. Okay. And uh, the okay. students that were in that building were, were transferred to another building um, so that uh, occupancy has gone up. And we've also been able to, to provide a solution uh, with the government. Oh, fantastic. It's always amazing to see how creative people get when times like these, that you know they completely turn around their business or they think about different propositions. So. Well done on that. Um, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. But there's, there's lots of challenges for everyone and it's, it's a very difficult situation. So uh, yeah. hopefully we'll be able to, uh, you know, ride through this in a good way uh, without having, you know, too many um, uh, like, uh, retail operators uh, go insolvent, etc. So we'll, yeah. Uh, yeah. we'll go through this and uh, still have a good, uh, you know, professional relation uh, after. Of course, we're not out of the woods yet, indeed. Yeah. Um, we also had a question from one of our members, Marie Abelveen, and she had a very specific question around, and I'll read it out for you. How much influence does 
Bauinvest real estate investors have on the building industry to produce more affordable and especially CO2 neutral buildings for the lesser income market. So I think yeah. the question here around affordability and sustainability, but yeah, the yeah. influence Bow Invest has on those two topics. Well, what would be your response to that question from Marie? Yeah, excellent question, which I'm very happy with. Uh, uh, Bow Invest um, uh, wants to be a socially responsible investor. Uh, that's also what our clients appreciate. We, we, we mainly invest for one client from the Netherlands internationally. And, uh, which means that we, we also want to focus on uh, contributing to society uh, in a positive way. And for instance, we have made investments in the residential sector, uh, for instance, in, in the US, uh, where we provide specifically affordable rental housing. Okay. Um, again, I think rental housing is a way to provide an affordable uh, solution to live in the city but uh, it, it, it's also, uh, it can also be expensive, but we, we also try to focus on affordable rental housing in that sense. At the same time, we have to make a, a solid return for our clients. Uh, I mean, we're not a, uh, what we call in the, in the Netherlands, a woningbouwvereniging or a government mm -hmm. entity. Um, uh, but we, we do believe we, we need to uh, have an eye on that. And, and we, we've also decided not to increase the rents, for instance, in the Netherlands, in our portfolio uh, this year because of the whole COVID-19 situation. Okay. Uh, with regards to carbon neutral approach, um, um, we, we generally focus on investing in property that is sustainable, that has sustainable quality, low energy uses or water uses, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Um, it's standard practice for our investment analysis. So for every investment, we, 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 we consider that. Um, and we also have a dedicated sustainability officer who participates in our investment committee and asks all the right questions and participates. Um, and, and we do uh, participate in global benchmarks. Uh, for instance, there's one benchmark that originates from the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, the global real estate sus sustainability benchmark, which is very much um, also stimulated by Dutch real estate investors. And there's a lot of Dutch pension fund money behind that. Um, and that benchmark has really grown and we have stimulated our partners in the Asia Pacific region also to, to participate in it. We basically request it. So that gives us a, a tool to analyze how we're tracking and we try to improve that uh, performance as well. Okay. Um, and for Australia specifically, Australia is kind of a leader in this space, uh, okay. especially in the commercial property uh, sector. Uh, the local groups are doing really well, uh, have high ratings. We have an office investment here, office portfolio, where the manager has um, set a strategy to, uh, to be carbon neutral this year for the whole portfolio. Uh, two assets in the portfolio already have a certificate for that. And, and that's uh, carried out or accomplished by, uh, again, uh, energy uh, uses, water usages, et cetera. So using LED lighting, uh, having on-site solar panels, et cetera. And also okay. buying off-site renewable energy. So that's, those are all kinds of measures. I think in the, getting back to the Australian housing market is a bit different in a way that many houses that's also our personal experience are not really well insulated which mm. means that uh, yeah so which means winter that is uh, coming. Heat, uh, sorry winter is coming winter is coming we all feel that um <laughs> so it's very pleasant outside um but uh, the houses are built for airflow uh, so so heat and cold come in quickly and disappear quickly as well so it, it, it all means you have to spend more money on, on electricity and, and, yeah. and gas, etc. So yeah. we, we think it should be potentially a better way of building. But um, uh, again, the, the, the market is more focused on developing uh, houses for sale, uh, which is then used as uh, private investment property or just, uh, you know, bought by, by people to live in. Uh, but there's not, not really an institutional market that stimulates uh, more uh, more sustainable type of building. 
There is an Australian government entity that is focused on it, uh, which is called the uh, Clean Energy Financing Corporation. And they're specifically targeting also the housing market. So we think that's, that's, uh, that's a good initiative, uh, but there's still uh, some leeway uh, here to go. Yeah, great. Well, great to hear that. I think Marie will be very uh, satisfied with your answer. And talking about those ratings in the commercial real estate, I remember moving into the brand new EY building on 200 George Street a few years ago. And uh, that was a five-star uh, sustainable energy building. And um, just recently after that, I moved into a Barangaroo in into a building in Barangaroo uh, for one of the clients that I was working with. Now they had a six star rating and just the, the ratings keep going up. You know, I believe there's even seven star ratings now. Uh, so I'm wondering where that is right. going. Yeah, well, that's yeah. the good thing. It's also the rating, what I refer to GRASP is, is on, on a relative basis. So every year, if you have a good rating this year, it's relative to the other participants in the benchmark. So okay. if the others move ahead of you, you, you go down in the rating. So yeah. uh, it, it, uh, it uh, stimulates continuous improvement. Yeah, it's good for the competition indeed. Yes, yeah. Very good. and hard to set uh, targets. Yeah. Or, or um, just moving into the, the, the last question, um, I'm really interested, Charco, also in, in your personal um, response to COVID-19, how you're dealing with it at a personal level and also maybe you can tell us a little bit about Hold On to Niwe, uh, the band that you and a few uh, friends have established uh, and uh, what the latest is on that. Yes, yeah I think you know um, our, our personal experience is very similar to other people. I mean we work from home, have been working from home, the kids have been schooling from, from home and um, so the, the amount of conference calls and webinars uh, grew exponentially, mm. uh, really exploded, but um, there was a lot more communication uh, with the Netherlands and our partners in the region to, to try to get a grip on what's happening. Um, and, and I guess uh, looking at how kids have uh, done in school is, is exceptional and remarkable how flexible they have been. I think uh, how flexible everybody has been. And, uh, Australia has done uh, uh, you know, done really well in, in containing the virus. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, relax uh, the measure somewhat without seeing new outbreaks. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's been our experience. Uh, initially, I thought it was a bit exaggerated. Uh, saw saw it more of the flu, and I think many people did, but. It uh, you know it was a lot worse than that, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about Holland Sydney uh, because I've seen a video go yeah. around about you guys playing Dumar songs and all kind of other Dutch hits. Um, what is the latest there? Well, yeah, we were ready to to gig. We we had some. Uh, well, it started with uh, within the Dutch community, of course. Um, uh, Bas introduced me to Philip. Uh, Philip. Uh, is the guy who brought Guus Mewis to uh, Sydney last year. Yep. Um, so I met, uh, I had a lunch with Philip and we called some people and within a few weeks we had a band going. And we, wow. uh, you know, we, we decided to focus just on Dutch music, uh, music of Dutch bands. And we have a very nice group of people. Uh, everybody's very dedicated, it's fun. Um, and uh, yeah, we were, uh, we called ourselves Hollandse Nieuwe, which for the non-Dutch uh, that, that, that uh, view this video. It's, uh, I think, one of the few Dutch culinary treats. It's salted uh, herring. Um, <laughs> and uh, Nieuwe refers to uh, the new uh, fish in, in town. And I have to show, it, it, say it doesn't refer to our age at all, as you can see. So we're, we're uh, some oldies playing uh, uh, some older Dutch music, but we also have some, uh, some newer, uh, artists like uh, Dawe Pop and Nilsson uh, and even Linda Rose and Jessica participate so there I'm sure go. we'll have a lot of fun and uh, we, we very much look forward to the first uh, uh, you know first gig uh, which hopefully will will uh, we're, we're planning to have that in September and hopefully uh, it's, it's allowed by then to, to have that and uh, hopefully uh, a lot of Dutch people will show up uh, 
and, and uh, refer, refer to them as being our maatjes, which is uh, another word for Hollandse Leeuwen. <laughs> oh, you stay within the theme, beautiful. Well, I will definitely be there. Uh, I was already looking forward to the King's Day event at Cargo Bar. Whenever that will be in, in September, uh, I promise I'll be there because I've seen the video. You guys are amazing, so well done. Um, thank you again for today's interview. I uh, really appreciate you sharing your insights uh, on behalf of Bow Invest, uh, the trends around affordability, sustainability, and how you're responding to COVID-19. So with that, uh, again, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you soon for a face-to-face -face cup of coffee or a beer, and then uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk further. Let's do that. Thank you very much, Doris, and um, yeah, looking forward to see you soon. Thank very you. Good. Thank you.